السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ مائی ڈیئر برادرز اینڈ سسٹرز اینڈ ویئرز آف وکرا ٹی کرا ٹی وی ویلکم ٹو ریئل ٹاک دس از دا پروگرام دیٹ از میڈ اسپیشلی فار یو ویر وی برنگ اسپیشل گیسٹ ہیئر ٹو ٹاک اباؤٹ ایشوز آف کنسرن وچ آر ایشوز دیٹ وی آل فیس آن اے ڈے ٹو ڈے بیسز آئی ہوپ یو ول انجوائے دا ریسٹ آف دا پروگرام آئی ہوپ یو انجوائے دا پروگرام وی ڈیڈ لاسٹ ویک ود آر لوکل ایم پی آئی ہیڈ لاٹس آف فیڈ بیک آن اٹ اینڈ ایوری بڑی دیٹ آئی ہیز فیڈ بیک ٹو می سیڈ ہاؤ ونڈرفل Naz was in the way she responded to some of the questions and some of the issues that she outlined as part of the program. Uh, this Real Talk is a program for you. Uh, we bring it to you in the hope that the guests that we bring along here are people who make a difference in people's lives, people who, ha- who connect people's lives in some way, shape or form. And they are inspirational to you that they've done work in the community and outside which is supporting the Muslim Ummah, not just in this country, but around the world as well. And as such, we have brought guests today to, he- to this program from Pakistan, from other parts of the continents. And we hope that we'll continue to do so in order to ensure that you get to hear and see people who are actually making some sort of difference in many, many people's lives across not just this country, but throughout the world. Today, I have a guest by the name of Muhammad Shabir, He's a well-traveled gentleman from what I've read about his profile. He has lived in many, many different countries. I'll come to that in a while. He's now basically a life coach, a lecturer on you know, giving people confidence in their careers, developing their careers and their life skills as well. And he lives in Skipton, uh, having lived in, in far east countries, in the Middle East as well. He is now a local person, has lived here for some time. He has also been through many, many different types of businesses and career changes himself. So he's a man who's well versed with different aspects of life around different times of individuals' lives that we go through. Muhammad Shabir Sahib, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuhu. Welcome to Ikra TV. You've not traveled that far, I hope. Skipton's just around the corner. But it's a beautiful, pa- beautiful part of the world, isn't it? Wa Alaikum Assalam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuhu. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. الحمد للہ رب العالمین وسلاۃ السلام علیہ اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین نبی علی محمد و علی علیہ وصحبہ اجمعین یس آئی ٹوڈے آئی ہیو ٹریولڈ ایکچولی فرام اسکپٹن ٹو مانچسٹر بیکاز آئی ہیڈ اے میٹنگ دیر ایٹ الیون او کلاک اینڈ دین آئی ہیڈ انودر میٹنگ ایٹ ٹویلو اینڈ دین آئی ہیڈ مائی لنچ ود سم فرینڈز آف مائنڈ اینڈ دین آئی رش تھرو دی ایم سکسٹی ٹو ٹو میک اٹ ہیئر آئی ہوپ اٹ واز کنجسٹیڈ نو مانچسٹر واز ویری کنجسٹیڈ ایم سکسٹی ٹو ان یوژلی یو نو آئی واز ریئلی پلیزنٹلی سرپرائز اٹ واز ان بیڈ سو آئی میڈ اٹ سو اٹس اے ڈی ٹور فرام اسکپٹن ویسلی بین اسٹڈنگ یور لائف یو آر اے ویری ویل ٹریولڈ پرسن یو لیو ان مینی مینی ڈفرینٹ سر فار ایسٹ کنٹریز یو نو اکراس ملیشیا سنگاپور etc. How have you crammed all this? You, you know, you seem to be still a young man well, in um, your life. I mean, you just lived in uh, Egypt for three years on, on the trot a couple of times. Yeah, I, I don't know. I tell you, one of my, my English friends from Skipton, uh, when he talked to me about traveling to China every other week, he said, he made a joke. He said, one of these days you meet yourself coming back. Yes. You know, and I think that the first few uh, trips were a little difficult until I organized myself and sorted myself out. Mm-hmm. And then I used to plan my travel in such a way that when I get to, uh, to China, in Guangzhou, I will go straight to work. Right. You know, you have a 13-hour journey, you travel, you, you first five hours, you know, you, you read, you meet people, you uh, walk about in the plane, and the last six hours, you sleep. Right. And then you, you're ready to, 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 to be knocked out. And then just two hours before you land, you, you wake up, and you have breakfast, you have, you know, get ready, and you're ready f- I'm ready for work. So what, what sort of business were you doing in China? I was uh, sourcing a lot of products for a lot of companies right. in Manchester, in London. So, so were you a buyer then, basically? Yeah, I was a buyer, but basically I actually would go into a, 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 a concept of an idea. We will design it, we'll manufacture it, we'll package it, and then we will export it. So obviously you're from Pakistan. Originally from Pakistan. Originally yeah. from Pakistan. How long have you lived in this country? I lived in uh, Yorkshire Dales for 47 years. Right. But prior to that, I was in Birmingham for a year. Right. My, my father, my, I have a large chunk of my family uh, in Birmingham and spread all over the England. Right. So, so, so what, what brought you into the beautiful 
as they say, God's own country. I mean, Yorkshire people say, well, this is God's own country, and I'm God's sure you probably agree with it, because you live well, in part of... So I tell you, I, I t used to tell Skipton people that this is the most beautiful place on the face of Earth, and nobody believed me. But two years ago, the Guardian conducted a survey of the best place to live in England, and they came up with the, uh, the Craven. I'm sure there must be better places in Yorkshire Dale. Then, then in the Pakistan, I'm sure there must be better places well, in I Pakistan well as well. I've travelled places, but let me tell you. Yeah. To me, people make places. All right. I think in Yorkshire Dale, we do have, you know, some uh, element that you know are not as nice, but Yorkshire Dale has some really, really beautiful people. Oh no, no nice I agree people. with you. I agree with you. I you know, totally people make places. Oh, well, of course, but the scenery. Scenery is. And it's obviously, in you know, summer, that's also there's no there's no better place than than places in England. I mean, this year I didn't travel anywhere, right? Apart from one trip to Pakistan and a wedding, I didn't go. And normally, as soon as the weather gets bad, I'll book and go away. All right. But this year I didn't need to so go it's anywhere. The it's, it's the time for you to go away now. It's it's, uh, it's winter time. I, I mean, reading maybe. reading your your sort of the, your profile and the work that you've done, obviously you spent uh, a lot of time in Egypt as well. Yes. Uh, you, you know, you've told me you went there and you learnt the Quran. You wanted to do some, you know, some learning of Islam. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you're a Muslim. You're a proud Muslim. Uh, you know, and you're also involved in, in, in the masjid, uh, and you, you know, involved in this initiative called Our Masjid, Our Future, and the Smart Mosque as well. Yes. And I, you tell me you're allied with the the Muslim Heritage Centre in Manchester, a place that I visited uh, a couple of times, and I'm very impressed by it. Uh, it's a huge site. Anybody who's not not been there, and who lives quite close to it, which is just on the outskirts of Old Trafford, uh, you know, I would certainly urge you to go and have a look. And there's some interesting artifacts there as well uh, uh, in the mosque, in, in the sort of the heritage centre. How did you get involved with this concept of our masjid, our future, and the smart mosque? Uh, what 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 is the the theory behind the driving our, force behind our, yeah. our you know our masjid, our future, and well, the smart masjid? I tell you, because I've been involved with, in education for almost 30 years, you know, learning and teaching and empowering myself and then empowering others, sharing my knowledge, my, you know, my business knowledge, my travel mm -hmm. knowledge. And I realized that the, the Ummah for 400 years have been going down and down. You know, it's really, we've not given much to the world in way of innovations. We're using all the beautiful things in the life, technology, uh, the bits that are developed by Western world and the Eastern world, mm -hmm. but we've not really been making any contribution. So I've been seriously looking for the last 20 years for the reasons that why aren't we doing, mm. you know, catching up with the rest of the world. And I realized that our masjid, and just look at the, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi masjid, no, in not. 10 years, they developed an ummah that in the next 20 years, 25 years, was ruling 25% of the world in mm -hmm. a beautiful manner. You know, and they developed some world-beating talents and people, you know, to be able to do that. They yes. was all developed from that masjid mm -hmm. in Medina. And I thought that slowly, and this, there's a history to behind this as well, slowly our masjid and services that we provide in our masjid have eroded. There are many reasons for that. Colonialism is one of the what, reasons. What, I mean, yeah, okay, you can, you can lay some blame to the colonialism and the imperialism. Some of it, right? not all of it. But not all of it. So wha what do you think are the main faults? Why some of that innovation, some of that desire to do well, to innovate, to develop technologies. The Muslims were the leaders in science and astronomy. Of course. Why have we lost all that then? But I think that, you know, the, I, I take you back 100 years. In 1923, there was only one Muslim free country. That was Turkey. Right. All the other... The but that, just because uh, you don't have a Muslim country doesn't no, no, mean uh, let me, Muslims let me, let me, cannot be innovators. Let me, let me explain. The, the colonialists was, were all over Indonesia, Malaysia, Pakistan, India, Africa, right. Middle East. And the first thing they did, um, you know, I'm not saying that you know, it's entirely their fault. They actually tried to establish some schools there. Mm -hmm. So they took the education away from the masjid, then to do schools. And I think that that might be a good thing in a way. But the Islamic education then, were also taken away from masjid partly. But, but is that their schools, fault? Is that our schools, fault? No, that schools then schools didn't deliver. No, no. No, let me let me get back to you this. Just because somebody comes and says we want to open a school. Yeah. And you know, try and produce secular education. Yeah. 
the old in the in the three, four, five hundred years ago, yeah. six hundred years ago, yeah. we had scientists who were not necessarily within Muslim universities. No, no. Right? There were but individuals who were interested in some areas of medicine, of technology, astrology, you know, and other parts of geology, etc. So why do you think that when the colonialists came yeah. and started their own sort of imposed their own system, that the Muslims sort of I think that's the, that's devolve the, themselves away that's from the it. decline. I think the decline of masjid was already happening. Right. But that just you know speeded it up. But to me, I think that you know the, when we talk about the technology and the development of sciences and modern sciences, I think we lost that almost four or five hundred years ago. The loss of Spain, Islamic right. Spain, because that time you know the the, the when the West were they call it dark ages, and they were uh, living in jungles basically. And some of them would not have a, a bath for the, maybe for entire life. There was 1,100 public hammams in Qurtuba alone. Mm -hmm. That was the art of living. The yes. Muslims had it. And I think Iqbal by today, we Muslims, we've lost that art of living as an ummah. Mm. How that happened? Well, that's the question I'm asking. That I mean, here we have, yeah. like you described, yeah. you know, in the, in the days when Spain was Islam, yeah. you know, Muslim, they didn't have any public laboratories. They didn't even have laboratories in the in the homes, etc. Yeah. You know, they, they were similar to what is in the conditions in really deprived, poor third world countries at the moment. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not going to describe, uh, may mention any countries. But the decline of Islam in terms of you know innovation, science, medicine, etc., predates all that, doesn't it? I think that you know when we when we look at where we where we lost it. I think that was the, the, the height of you know, Islamic civilization in Spain and in Turkey, of course, at the same time. Turkey, I, I, I've traveled to these countries right. to see, to, to, to gauge for myself as to why. And as I read a brief history on the wall of the Topkapi Palace as to why the Turkish Empire fo fell. And it took a whole 120 years mm -hmm. from its beginning of its fall to eventual fall. So things that you see that the, these big great empire, empires, they don't build overnight and they certainly don't fall overnight. Mm. You know, the, the, the things happen. And I think that, you know, the, the Muslims basically lost the value of knowledge and education. I think that the Allah's promise is that if you've got manners and you've got education, no matter who you are, mm -hmm. you will excel. And that's what the world has. So do you think the focus of the Muslim world Change from being innovators, yeah, being leaders to consumers to to no no not just consumers, to say we want to retreat ourselves into spirituality, and nothing but spirituality, and you know we will not care about yes. other matters. Is that is that what you I, I think alluding to? I think that you know even even we are very doing very poorly at spirituality as well, aren't we? Well, I'll come to for that. Yes, for last yes. for last four hundred years we not we we haven't got either. Right. You know, we, we, uh, there's, a, there's a, a former sheikh that you know, said that we are Muslims, we're suffering in this world because we're Muslims. And when we get to the other end, maybe we're not the Muslims that are needed there as well. Mm -hmm. So we've lost. That's a really good point. We've yeah. lost to the both hands. You know, we've, right. lost, we've lost here. You know, we're suffering because we're, we're, we're so-called Muslims. And we're not the Muslims that are acceptable over there. So if I was to put you in a room full of you know, young people, yeah. a couple of hundred people, young people, you know, yeah. what would your message be to them? Well, to be, to be honest with you, young people today, that, that when I work with a lot of young people, and it, it's even I get down to, to their level, I get down on the floor with them, and I sit down, and I really have fun, I laugh with them, I do arm wrestling with them. But a lot of young people, we have serious issue because they've been neglected for, for three generations. So that neglect has such an effect that mm. our young people's attitude has developed where there's a massive, massive gap between our understanding and theirs. And I see that, you know, a, a child on the street, or not a child, a, a youth, a 18, 20 year old, if you're walking towards him, before he comes to you, he will cross the road just to miss you. All right. This is the kind of, you know, the, uh, the disconnect that's there. And it's not gonna happen overnight. Mm -hmm. And I think that, it, that somebody needs to start somewhere to close that is gap. That, is that happening in certain communities and cultures, or is it across the board? I, I, mean, I, I you know, you s I see that in the Middle East, it's slightly different. I see that I'm in talking Asian, about in, in the Asian subcontinent. Yeah, my I mean, let me let me be absolutely blunt. Yeah, in the Asian subcontinent, I've seen them dis 
some you know, differences in yeah. attitudes between Indian Muslims, Bangladeshi Muslims, and Pakistani Muslims. And if you go further south and east, yeah. Malaysian, Indonesian Muslims, their attitude towards Islam and the world, yeah. and the attitude of Pakistani young men and Indian young men, there's quite a lot of difference between them. I think that is that cultural then. I think that you know the, the, the there's always been an issue, yeah. right? For as far as back as I've read, that you know the, the culture. Sadly, we've we've got a lot of cultural baggage here as well. Mm -hmm. Cultural always takes the front seat, and Islam takes the back seat. Right. You know, a lot of people, whenever they were much rather give up something Islamic, and they find it very very difficult to give up something cultural. Right. You know, I find that that is a very powerful statement. It to is make. a very powerful statement. If I that is true. Then are you saying that Islam is a secondary function in people's lives? Well, in my lifetime, I see that time and again. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of people question when you talk about the Asia subcontinent, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. A lot of people question even today that Islam went there 1,400 years ago. But are the people of subcontinent ready for Islam now? Because well, when I, I look, they profess to be Muslims. I mean, Pakistan is seen as a is a Muslim country but at the moment and you know has been for the last 70 I, years. I asked one of my cousins whose father was an imam at Masjid in Pakistan right. and he's a mashallah imam here. I asked him only last week, he's nearly 80 now. I said, when did you actually become a functional Muslim and a Muslim by choice? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people get offended when you ask him that. But when people get close to reality, they, get, they, get, they know they're close to the grave, they will give you a good answer. A straight answer. He goes, I was 54 when I became a Muslim by choice. Right. Because before that, I was just a born Muslim. Again, a very st st strong statement. But uh, let me tell you, my experience tells me with travels all over the world, but I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about Britain here. The Muslim that we have, they mix here. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who are born in Muslim families, they're just born Muslims. They really haven't. They ha I, I know literally tens of thousands of people that I'm connected with either my family or my business or my uh, links with people. And not many of them have actually s looked at that contract because Islam is not just being bo born, you know, you're a Muslim. You have to actually then read the conditions of the contract and sign it. And the closest people that I see to Islam is new Muslims, rebirths, mm -hmm. the people that, you know, they look to go through. I have a brother in Skipton that became Muslim about 12, 14 years ago. Right. But he took the very first Islamic awareness that we did in 90s. He took a Quran away that day. And he studied Quran four times in a language that he understood. Then he asked, he studied whole of the Bukhari, whole of the Muslim. Then he asked me to give him a book on the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I gave him a, a, a book on Sirah. He read that. And at the time he so was are ready. Are you saying that a lot of people who are Muslims yeah. are Muslims in name, but do not really understand what true Islam is all about. Well, shall I, shall I I'll give you an answer for that. I got asked almost 20 years ago by a new Muslim, and he says to me, he's a famous new Muslim, mashallah, he, he was my, my friend, we was doing dawah together. He goes, Shabir, what is Islam? So I start explaining in my own way. I was 40 something at the time. And he said, no, you don't know. Then he asked me, who's your Lord? Mm -hmm. So I started explaining again. Allah is my Lord, this, this, that. He goes, you don't know. Then he says, who's Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And to this, I said, look, you know, I'm waffling. I don't know. I put my hands up. I said, you tell me. He goes, if I tell you, it will go over your head. You wouldn't value it. You won't remember it. Go research. Go look for it yourself. So what did you find? Well, I tell you, if I gave you this answer, yeah then I'm not following the let practice of my... No, no, no. I mean, here you are, you know, obviously well, we're talking about well, let me, the, the, I'll give the you, disconnection. I'll, I'll give you the one example. Mm -hmm. of, uh, we've got three qu questions there. Yeah. And I'll give you a, a hint of the one answer. I, following that, 20 years, I traveled the world and I asked some of the people who are Quran Hafiz, who are Muftis, I asked them these three questions because I researched and, and it, I struggled to find the answers. And it, in, mm -hmm. in the end, I did find the answers. There is three large books written on these three questions. Right. They're called the Hasul Islatha, the three principles. There are three questions that we're going to be asked in grave. 
And I didn't have the answers at 40, 41. And many, many people that I asked up to now don't right. have the answers. And many of the people even don't know where the answers are. And I tell you, th what is Islam? Mm -hmm. Islam is three, this is very basic, three levels. And that is covered by the Hadith of Jibreel. Just enlighten us, please. Now, the Hadith of Jibreel, let, let, Hadith let Jibreel is... Just explain those to the two is, viewers and myself. Islam is, is of three levels. Mm -hmm. And this is where Prophet was mm -hmm. sat amongst the companions. And then this man walked in with extremely white clothes, dark hair, all looking nice and clean, and no signs of travel. And he walked in, yet nobody knew him. He walked in, he started climbing over the people, and he came and sat next to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and put his hands on the knees of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he asked the first question, O oh Muhammad, what is Islam? And all the companions are, because they, firstly, they, they're shocked that we, we don't know him, and he's got no signs of travel, so where does he come from? So then he says, he asked this question, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, tell him what the Islam is, the five pillars of Islam, yeah? And then he said, you've spoken the truth. So the company is saying that who is this cheeky man that is asking a question and then he's telling Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that you've spoken the truth. Yeah. So he asked the next question, what is Iman? Now Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave him the six conditions or the pillars of Iman and then he asked what is Al-Ihsan? Now many of, many of our scholars, the so-called scholars that I've met, they don't even know. Was that the second question, what is yeah. Ihsan? Yeah, uh, Iman, Iman. Iman. Oh, sorry, Iman. First is Islam, second is Ihsan, uh, Iman. Uh, Iman, and third is Ihsan. Ihsan right. Now, Ihsan is, so the Prophet ﷺ gave the answer for Ihsan, and he said, you spoke the truth. Now, I'm just going to cover you these three. The first level of is, is Islam, which is the five pillars, mm -hmm. which is your Shahada, your prayer, your fasting, your Zakat, your Hajj. That is the lowest level of your deen. The next level, that is outwardly action. Mm -hmm. Everybody sees you do this. You take a shahada, you have witnesses. You pray, people see you. You fast, people see you. You zakat, give zakat, people see you. You go hajj. They're outwardly actions. That is the lowest level. Mm -hmm. The next level is iman, which is inwardly. Iman is all the six pillars of iman are to do with your heart. Only Allah knows that if you have that iman, you believe in him, you believe in his angels, his prophets, his books the Day of Judgment, the Qadr. So, the, that's the second level. Now the third level is Hassan. Hassan being the excellence is whenever you, you're doing the first five or the second six, you know that Almighty, the Creator, is watching, watching you. you yeah. And He's witnessing you. He knows, you, you know, and you imagine as you're seeing Him, but because we can't see him, you imagine that he is seeing you. Mm. So when you bring that kind of excellence into your first and the second, you elevate in them. But isn't that <coughs> when you say Ihsan is when you, you know, truly in your heart and in your mind, you believe that you know, Allah is watching you all the time. Yeah. And therefore your actions would reflect that fact that Allah is watching you yeah. all the time. And if you have real Iman you know, in your heart, then you will behave in you such a way. You know that he knows. Yeah. I mean, we'll come back to it, but isn't that part of the second one then? You know, the second one, what is Iman? Because Iman itself is a, is a fundamental acceptance that there is something there that you fundamentally yeah. believe yep. in. We're going to have to go for a break. Yeah. We have a break now coming up. We've really enjoyed it so far. Inshallah, don't go away. Come back soon. Uh, we'll be with you soon and we'll continue this conversation with Muhammad Sabir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.